Now, if we're really gonna find inverses that are functions, we know we have to restrict the domain. We learned that when we were talking about inverse functions. And so we actually need to restrict the domain of sine and cosine so that the inverse will be a function too. That means that the domain for each of these trig functions must pass a horizontal line test. So let's actually, and, and you know, if I pull out my handy dandy ruler here, you can see that right now, this, uh, the graph of sine clearly does not pass a horizontal line test anywhere where it's graph and has range. So I'm going to go ahead and start restricting the domain. I'm going to pick up a highlighting tool and I suggest you do the same to show this on your own graph. And I'm going to start at zero because zero is a nice place to start. Uh, and I move to the right as far as I possibly can. So if I start at zero and move to the right, um, the goal is to continue to pass a horizontal line test. And I can do that all the way till I get to the very top of the sine curve at pi over two comma one. That's where I have to stop because if I go any further, I will stop passing a horizontal line test. But I could actually go from zero to the left a little further and continue to pass it. So I'm gonna pick up my highlighting tool again and go from zero comma zero to the left on the sine curve, all the way down to negative pi over two comma negative one. And so this piece, this piece that's highlighted between negative pi over two and pi over two, that's a very nice invertible piece. Now, are there other pieces we could have chosen? Yes, but none of them will be as easy as the piece that includes zero. And so that's why I'm choosing that piece. So the restricted domain that we choose in general in all of mathematics to inverse sine x is between left bracket negative pi over two to pi over two with a right bracket. That's the restricted domain for sine x. I'm gonna actually take my pen and kind of darken this little area here so you can see it really well with well-defined endpoints. That's what we invert. Now that restricts the range as well. If I just look at that little piece that I've highlighted and darkened in, the range for y equals sine x would be from negative one to positive one with brackets on both sides. Let's do the same thing for cosine x. So again, I'm gonna start at zero. So I'm gonna start at zero, one, because it's always easiest to start at zero and include that in a restricted domain. So going from zero, I'm gonna follow the graph of cosine until I would stop passing a horizontal line test. So I'm gonna follow the graph of cosine down, still passing a horizontal line test, still passing a horizontal line test. And when I finally get to pi, that's where I would no longer pass a horizontal line test if I went any further. So in this case, I'm gonna use the little section that is between zero and pi. I'm gonna darken that in so you can see it really well. That section does pass the horizontal line test, so its inverse should pass the vertical line test. It's starting to hail here, just in case you can hear that. And so the restricted domain is gonna be from left bracket zero to pi right bracket. And the restricted range is still going to be from negative one to one with brackets on both sides. All right, so below what you see are graphs of sine and cosine with their restricted domains. I've shown you exactly how you would put them into Desmos. You would write y equals sine x with a brace and then negative pi over two is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to pi over two with a right brace that restricts the domain to the proper set of values. And so now we're gonna write the domain and range of the inverse sign based on that. The domain and range of the inverse sign is exactly the opposite, the domain and range of the sine graph. So the domain of sine we're using is negative pi over two to pi over two. That becomes the range for inverse sine bracket negative pi over two to pi over two. The domain, sorry, the range of sine that we used was negative one to one. That becomes the domain of inverse sine, negative one to one. And then let's go ahead and draw the inverse for this. You have a graph of y equals x there. And if you're good at this, you can kind of sketch exactly equidistance from one side to the other where the points would go to get a perfect reflection over 
y equals x. And I'm going to go ahead and label my domain of y equals inverse sine x to be between negative 1 and 1, and my range to be between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then just for good measure, I'm going to highlight that in yellow so I can see which one is actually the inverse. This gets a little confusing to see them both. So the yellow one I've highlighted is the inverse sign. Okay, so let's look at cosine. Again, I've given you the Desmos description to draw this in Desmos with the restricted domain. So that's y equals cosine x, left brace, 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to pi. Let's start by defining the domain and range of the inverse first, just like we did last time. So the domain of this cosine piece is 0 to pi. That will be the range of the inverse piece, 0 to pi with brackets on both sides. And then the range of the original piece is negative 1 to 1. That will be the domain of the inverse of cosine, negative 1 to 1 with brackets on both sides. This one's a little harder to draw the inverse of. Um, you may find it easier to mark in the domain and range first for the inverse graph of cosine. So the domain will be from negative 1 to 1. 1 is a little bit less than pi over 2. So here's my 1 and negative 1. And then my range would be from 0 to pi, so 0 to a little bit above 3. And so now I'm going to go ahead and sketch in my opposite values. Instead of 0, 1, I have 1, 0. And instead of pi, negative 1, I have negative 1 comma pi and then I'm going to just make sure I cross at y equals x and see the inverse graph there. Again I'm going to um, mark it as y equals inverse cosine of x, highlight it in yellow so it's a little easier to see which graph I'm talking about and again you could double check that your domain and range look correct. These are really tricky to invert uh, to draw the inversions for because you start with one axis labeled in pies and the other labeled in integers and then you actually have to reverse that. So it can be a little bit uh, crazy to do. Now let's do the same thing with tangent. Let's restrict the domain of tangent so that the inverse will actually be a function. We'll just play the same game. We'll start at 0, 0 and we'll move to the right as far as we can to still pass a horizontal line test. So I'm going to start at 0, 0 and highlighting. I'm moving to the right and I can basically move until I hit the first vertical asymptote and that should all pass a vertical line test. I can do the same thing in the opposite direction from 0, 0. So moving to the left from 0, 0, I should be able to go down to negative infinity in terms of the range. And so it's basically that first period of tangent that falls between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's the one I'm going to invert. The restricted domain for tangent x is going to be from left parentheses negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 with a right parentheses. The reason we have parentheses is because there are asymptotes on both sides of this piece of tangent we're using. I'm actually going to highlight those asymptotes as part of the invertible graph because I want to remember that when I invert this, the asymptotes will go from vertical asymptotes to horizontal asymptotes. So right now these asymptotes are at x equals pi over 2 and at x equals negative pi over 2. Those should invert to y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2. Now the range for this piece of tangent I'm using is actually negative infinity to infinity. We include all the values of the range with one period of tangent. Okay, let's do this for the inverse now. So the domain of tangent becomes the range of the inverse. So the domain negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 becomes the range, oops, that should say range there, of the inverse. So negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in parentheses. And the domain was the old range, so the, that would be negative infinity to infinity. Keep in mind that the original did have vertical asymptotes, 
So the inverse will have horizontal asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. You might find that it's nice to uh, calculate what that is as a decimal. So let's go ahead and do a quick calculation of pi over 2, which is 1.57. Let's go ahead and draw in those asymptotes at 1.57. And notice that that actually puts it right where the asymptote will cross the line y equals x. And then negative 1.57 is again where y equals x crosses the asymptote from the original function. And then we just need to draw in our inverse. And so it still goes through 0, 0. And it looks something like this. It is a graph that moves between a between two horizontal asymptotes. Note that this is the first time that we've seen two horizontal asymptotes for one graph. It's not the only function that does it, but it is the first one we've seen in this series. And so we have horizontal asymptotes at y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2. This is a graph that is always increasing. It hits at 0, 0. Um, it has a nice domain of negative infinity to infinity and a range between left parentheses negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 right parentheses.